So, so that, that's a really good point. Now, uh, Jess, your pioneering study in ISMI where you showed the profound differences between outdoor and indoor air at the same site uh, can be interpreted to, to say that we're already changing the microbiology of the built environment to a tremendous degree. It's just that we're doing it in a completely undirected way where we don't know how we're changing it. Yeah, uh, I feel, does that change? Yeah, I feel like the language that they're using here might be a little confusing because maybe when we're using the word manipulate, what people mean is spraying microbes into a building. And when I, um, when I use the word intervention or um, as an example, um, I would say that uh, ventilation source could be considered an in intervention. Mm -hmm. So if you're, and that, those decisions are being made whether we like it or not. These buildings all around the world are being designed in all of these different ways, whether we like it or not. And so we are going to see these differences in the microbiome depending on the decisions that are being made by architects and designers. And maybe that's a different class of, um, of uh, intervention than what we're referring to, which would be inoculating indoor microbiomes or, you know, I think when, when Jeff, when you mentioned um, um, the uh, issue of uh, temperatures and um, um, comfort in buildings, uh, I was reminded of a study that showed that buildings are adjusted to a temperature that accommodates men and women freeze. Um, <laughs> I'm freezing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so too hot. so how, how, do you, how do you accommodate the individual? And again, if you spray a room with microorganisms, and if you're immune compromised, that microorganism could very well be your death bell. So um, this is really complicated um, a, a kind of, a, I don't mean to be, you know, putting, a, rain, be raining on the microbiome parade. I just <laughs> want to say that it's fascinating and it's exciting, but it's really early. Well, well, speaking of temperature, uh, Rita, your groundbreaking work linking cholera epidemics to water temperature and uh, weather patterns, um, uh, you, you, if, uh, I, I've, I've seen you speak about the tremendous struggle that it took to get, uh, to get acceptance of the link between medical microbiology and environmental microbiology in that context. Uh, what, what lessons do you think we have to learn in the indoor environment to maybe shorten that path between the initial discoveries and uh, a widespread acceptance that, these, uh, that uh, environmental microbiology could be linked to human health in the indoors as it is outdoors? Rob, that's a really great, great question and issue. I, I truly think it's a matter of educating interdisciplinarily. I think the difficulty um, is that um, the medical curriculum has been, at least until recently, pretty rigid. And um, the environmental path just doesn't coincide or overlap. And therefore, the principles and the hypotheses uh, in medicine and in environmental health just simply don't, don't uh, cross over. And I, I do think that it does take um, a combination of engineers and um, public health people, uh, medical doctors uh, who are trained quite specifically, as well as microbiologists and uh, physicists and chemists, really to be focused um, together on solving problems, which again comes to another issue that I feel strongly about. And that is uh, we've always had this, what I call a kind of nonsensical argument between applied and basic um, creativity-driven research. Mm -hmm. Obviously, I'm very enthusiastic about creativity-driven uh, research. However, if we focus on solving a problem to utilize creativity, then I think that really can be a societal norm. And I guess engineers have been doing this all along, uh, but um, we always think of engineers as not necessarily being creativity. Well, that's not fair, because you build things. But, but I, I do think the answer is, is having an interdisciplinary uh, uh, problem-solving approach. Um, well, so, so it sounds like you're advocating something a lot like uh, the, uh, the, the microbiology of the built environment program that, uh, that, that Poller has set up and that the Sane Foundation has been very active in funding uh, to create that interdisciplinary community and 
especially uh, trainees that come out of that interdisciplinary community and uh, have at least uh, some sense of the other parts uh, and other disciplines that, um, that, that can bear on their problem, as well as having an appreciation for the, uh, the cultural differences and differences in language uh, that, that you need to reach out across in order to make progress. Um, what, so so given, given that this community exists now, what, what, what do we have to do in order to take the results that we've uh, developed as a community and get them into, for example, Harrison's, which is one of the key medical textbooks, or uh, Jeff, perhaps you can tell me what the engineering equivalent of Harrison's is. Uh, you know, what, what would be necessary for the uh, education community to accept that there's something here that's important enough to put into the core curriculum? How about the building codes is the, uh, the, is building the, code. the equivalent. Yeah. So, so, what, uh, so, so forgive my ignorance on this, uh, but, but what, what would it take to get into the building code some sort of principle about, uh, uh, about building uh, microbiome efficiency the same way that I assume there's things in there about ventilation efficiency and energy efficiency? You know, that's a, a, a good question, and I think the short answer is it would take evidence-based science to support uh, uh, whatever inclusion of material. Uh, was going in there, um, and also it would probably take the usual lobbying and that sort of thing uh, 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 to, to, to make any change. But I think that the other piece that can happen on a much shorter time scale uh, is the public education piece. And I think that that's something that we heard from the plenary uh, uh, yesterday and is uh, part of a lot of what has been going on. Uh, in this program is this idea that the public has to recognize it as being important and then that will drive many of the things like building codes. Do, do you have a concern about uh, having the public be enthusiastic about it in advance of the evidence base though? I mean, uh, I, I, I say this, uh, so, so I moved to, moved to San Diego a little less than three years ago and uh, you know, as one does on moving to California, I bought a couple of citrus trees for my patio and uh, the special fertilizer for the citrus trees had emblazoned on the bag, uh, you know, new with probiotics. And that may have been the only time that the probiotics were actually derived from BS rather than just metaphorically. But I think there's a lot of that going around, right? And so, what? What? Do you, um, and this this is really a question for the whole panel. What What do you think is the uh, is, is the appropriate balance between uh, encouraging the public to be enthusiastic about a concept versus having a really solid evidence base? Like when when is it when is it the right time to uh, get the public excited about a new scientific direction? I, I guess I'll uh, chime in here first. Um, my experience is mostly in the hospital environment, and I think uh, I think they'll probably be the last ones to implement changes because the bar is very high in terms of, you know, um, not wanting to be perceived as uh, as not doing enough to fight infection. Uh, and one of the things that I've uh, noticed in working with my clinical collaborators, especially even the head of uh, epidemiology at the hospital, and also getting uh, studies approved to to you know to do in the hospital, is that the incentives are very different for doctors and for um, you know people trying to change things like us. Uh, their incentives are very immediate. They have a person dying in front of them or people that are sick in the hospital and they are putting out fires all the time. They just wanna figure out how can I do what's best at this moment for this patient. And they're really individualized choices made for each patient um, by each doctor. And really, again, going back to what I said earlier about this being collective decisions, um, they're really not thinking about how can this environment be healthier. And I think maybe the chief of epidemiology is, but I think again, it's it's up against what is the perception of uh, you know doing enough to fight disease in the hospital um, versus changing and I think uh, the built environment. And I think there have been changes, for example, um, circulation of air in hospitals and things like that. But uh, I think given what we we are learning about how. Um, the microbiomes of different rooms and different, and the movement of people and what that all means. Um, I, I do think that it's going to be a high bar to to implement some of those things, unless unless there's a very clear uh, um, impact on human health. 
I just had an idea. Um, I, I really like the way that you framed that there are um, personalized decisions and collective decisions, and the work that we're doing could impact both. So personalized decisions might be, what am I going to do in my home? And then a collective decision a would be, um, <laughs> what, um, how are we going to manage this hospital? And it seems that um, we may not have as much control over those personalized decisions because consumers are going to do what they want to do. But it seems like the bar, what I'm hearing is the bar is much higher for collective decisions and uh, it requires this um, uh, scientific evidence and evidence-based decision making. Now that's a really interesting point and I'd like to bring it back to something Rita said about the, uh, the individual and personalized nature of the microbiome. So, uh, so I think, uh, so one, one possibility is that hospitals might provide a great opportunity for stratifying people in that you have, uh, you, you have different rooms in the hospital that are carefully controlled um, in, in many respects. And if it turned out that you had groups of people who responded the same way to a particular, uh, to a particular microbial environment, you could think about uh, having those differences in different wards and then moving people into that ward based on some stratification you did up front. Um, and and that, that could be kind of a middle ground between individual decisions people are making in their own homes versus an institutional decision where you have to do the same thing throughout a building. Um, what, uh, um, um, so so, so if, if, you were, if you were thinking from the perspective of a hospital administrator, uh, what technologies do we have right now and what technologies might we be able to develop in the future that would allow uh, separation of the microbiomes in different rooms to, to try out that kind of, uh, that kind of stratification? And uh, what, what's, what sort of trouble do you anticipate getting ethical approval for such a study? Like, does that, seem, uh, does that seem like the sort of thing that would be easy or the sort of thing that would be hard based on your experiences? I guess this is a question for everyone, really, uh, because I know you've all done work that uh, uh, impinges on that question. Actually, um, we're just completing a, <clears throat> a study with a team in um, uh, Virginia uh, with neonates who were moved into a a new building, a new room, from separate room to this larger area. And it turned out really, if I could summarize in a word, that the environment plays a major role in the uh, colonization of the infant. Um, so it's clear that we already are introducing an effect by the environment that we choose to operate in, uh, in a hospital. Um, so I'm, I, I think that that we need to do more of these kinds of analyses, which we're hearing reported at this meeting, in order to, uh, to, to get into a logical frame of, 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 of construction. Oh, and, and you, said, you said you were still completing that study, so you may not be able to uh, uh, tell, uh, tell us the results, or you may not have the results. But were there some kids who did better in, uh, some neonates who did better in the first room than in the second room, and others who did the reverse? Like, do you have any preliminary evidence that uh, which environment you do better or worse in is highly individualized? Uh, it turns out that um, it, it really doesn't matter whether they're in a solitary room or in a large room. It depends on the environment of the area and the microbiology of the area in which they are located. Interesting. Okay. Interesting. So I, I would make two points. The first point is that the healthcare environment is interesting because if it's operating the way it should, it does offer a lot more control than uh, other typical environments. Um, however, the way we conceptualize control in most healthcare environments are things that uh, diminish the microbial community. And so that is things like ultraviolet lights, the cleaning regimen, those sorts of things. And so uh, I, don't, I know of one study, a small study in an Italian hospital where they tried an alternative approach. Uh, but I don't really know of a lot of research on whether that can be done and whether it can be kept contained in, in different environments. The other point I would make, and this is a more general point than just healthcare facilities, but I think it is a really important one, is that we do a lot of research based on the communities of microorganisms that are present. And I think that there is a really important piece that has to start including the biomass uh, of, of organisms that are present. And I think that um, we should be doing more biomass dependent research when we're doing looking at issues like this because the community is only telling part of the story. And would you include um, 
not only biomass, but gene copy number, for example, some metric that gives, allows you to get at um, exposure. I trust the people who tell me I should include gene copy number. Yes. Uh -huh. <laughs> I'd like to comment back on, on the point that you were raising, Rob, about um, how do we get environment and medicine sort of working together. There is the One Health movement, mm -hmm. and I, I really do endorse it. Uh, this is getting veterinarians and... Um, human medical doctors, to, or medical doctors who treat humans, um, I hope they're all human, um, to, to work together um, and also to include the environmental scientists, atmospheric as well as uh, microbiologists, because most of the emerging infectious diseases are coming from the environment, coming from animals. So understanding um, the environment is really critical to be able to practice medicine um, more effectively. Yeah, so, so that's a great point, Rita. Uh, Alana, did yeah. you want to comment on this topic as well? Sure, I'll weigh in there. Um, so I think uh, I'll uh, add to the comment about dosage and exposure, um, and also uh, mention that the route of ingestion or uh, you know the route of exposure of these organisms might also be important. And so we've heard a lot to, uh, today, and uh, I'm sure we'll hear a lot tomorrow about kind of what gets you know the dust that's in the air or uh, you know what we might. Um, um, breathe in, uh, but we also what we might touch and then put in our mouths. Uh, and so this might also dictate how we respond to these microorganisms. So for example, it might be that breathing in certain antigens or certain microbes might be very important for our immune system to prevent asthma, for example. But we know also that to transmit a lot of bacterial infections, often you have to touch them and then ingest them. You know, so perhaps this would dictate that we should leave kind of the dust around, but maybe uh, we should have our high-touch surfaces be made out of certain, you know, you know, compounds that don't, you know, copper or these have antibacterial coatings and, and just do that, whereas leave certain aspects of the microbiome, the kind of built environment untouched. Um, and then the other, the last thing that I would say is that I think um, changing buildings uh, might have, it, you know, that's a long-term strategy, whereas uh, uh, inventing products that can be um, integrated in our bin built environments. So, I mean, UV lights, for example, is one, but you can imagine others that don't reduce the microbiome and maybe uh, support it in some way. Um, but we can imagine that certain products uh, might be much more uh, amenable to changing the environment versus trying to re fabricate a building. 